many. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. Oh my God, Christ, my bike, right. Oh, God's sake. Oh, God. Why do I do this to myself every single time? Hello, my name is Emma. I am a conflict grad, filmmaking grad, and as you can see, I have a problem. <laughs> Christ. While I need an introduction, I'm sure the fact that I have an impulse buying problem clearly needs no introduction because it's abundantly clear. I'm gonna put these down for- oh! Drop them slash sort of like, I don't know, break a wrist or something? But I have this like toxic tray where like, um, there's like multiple piles of books on my desk right now. Hello, welcome to my bedroom. I redid my bedroom. It's gonna be a video on that. It's Christmas. <laughs> there's a Christmas tree in my living room. My parents sold the house, so there is lots of people in my apartment. It's no longer my apartment. So yeah, there's just a lot going on, so welcome to my room. Filming videos sat on my bed at like it's 20 fucking 14. Either what it is. So I have, of course, because of course I do, another book haul. I have a rule where I can't put a book into my proper bookcases unless I have put it in a book haul. So what happens is like they collect on my desk for like months. So I end up with videos like this. I, I bought these over several months, I promise. So here we go, here. <laughs> yeah, the book is a book recently. Um, there is no rhyme, no reason, no pattern apart from Emma C, Emma 1, Emma Bye. Are you wondering why I have no money? This, this, this is, we know where my money is. We know. I haven't bought a coffee table book in a very long time. I don't usually buy them. I know some people are quite obsessed with them. We don't have a coffee table that we can put coffee table books on. So I'm not that interested in them. But oh my gosh, when I saw that this was being released, I was like, well, I need that. It needs to be Sophia Coppola archive from her work from between 1999 and 2023. If you didn't know, Sophia Coppola is one of my favorite film directors. So this is everything from Marie Antoinette, Virgin Suicide, so Priscilla as well is in here. And like, I'm very excited to see that. So I've kind of not been looking at all the pictures from Priscilla because I kind of, I want to be surprised, but it even has yeah, Bling Ring, which I didn't like as much. Somewhere, which I actually, I really liked that movie. Um, but nothing will ever top my love for Marie Antoinette. Like, that movie is just such a vibe. Um, of course, there's a translation. Imagine your first feature being Virgin Suicides. It's so good. Obviously, imagine your dad being Francis Ford Coppola, but that's, like, totally beside the point, right? But this one was just, like, one of those where I'm like, well, obviously I need that. And also it matches. I bought this, <laughs> well, my mum bought this gem for me yesterday. It's a Christmas present. And it's... It's just, like, hi, Bobby. I'm a big fan. It's neon fucking pink. I can get away with wearing stuff like this. And the fact that I know that's my personality makes me so freaking happy. I'm like, I'm doing something right. Right? I was doing one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. Why did I do that? Next up, Jean Reese, Rice, Why Sargasso, Why Sargasso C. I'm probably saying that completely wrong, but it is what it is. <coughs> One of the works of genius of the 20th century, born into oppressive colonial society, Creole heiress Antoinette Cosway meets a young Englishman who is drawn to her innocent sexuality, innocent, sorry, sensuality and beauty. After their marriage, disrupting rumours begin to circulate, poisoning her husband against her. Caught between his demands and her own precarious sense of belonging, Antoinette is driven towards madness. Inspired by Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre and is set in the lush, beguiling landscape of Jamaica in the 1830s. I bought this because I had heard of it and it sounded vaguely familiar. I don't know anything about this book, I don't know anything about this author. It just, it just sounded like a vibe. Look, I buy books purely based off of that, right? Am I gonna like this? Uh, is this good? Uh. We'll find out somewhere in the depths of my brain. My mind was like, you've heard of that. So I was like, okay, cool. I love that you guys come here sometimes thinking like you're gonna get intellectual discussion and I'm just here like vibes. But also the fun thing about doing this right is that I can go, I don't know anything about this book. One of you will and you always share and that's like the really cool fun thing about this. I know nothing of this.
tell me what do you think. The other thing is I bought this in Dawn Books. If you've been to London, if you live in London, what I love so dearly about Dawn Books is they organise their books by country and like by territory. If I'm feeling a certain like setting, I can find that by just going to the North America section or to the Central America section or to the Caribbean section or to like North Africa or like the Middle East. Like that's what I find so fun. That chain of bookshops is one of my favourite reasons for going. Also the one in Malibu High Street is obviously stunning. It's like kind of my favourite thing is like where in the world <laughs> can I go today? And so with this one I'd be going to Jamaica in the 1830s. I've never been to Jamaica in the 1830s. Have you? No? Let's go! And that's why I should read books. End of video, end of discussion. <laughs> right. Lucky dip. Enchi. Masks. An esoteric masterpiece. This is where I always forget what esoteric means. I have literally been told about 25 times. It's just one of these words my brain can't retain for every reason. Yusuko is young, charming, sparkling, with intelligence and beauty, and a widow. Ibuki is in love with her and so too is his friend Mikame. But that is not the difficulty. What troubles Ibuki is the curious bond that has grown between Yusuko and her mother-in-law, Miko, a handsome, cultivated, yet jealous woman in her 50s, who is manipulating the relationship between Yusuko and the two men who love her. I'm a good. This is very short, this is like a hundred pages. I'm still looking, racking books up to do a video of, you know, classics under a hundred pages, or like around a hundred pages, which I think would be very fun. But yeah, this is Japanese. Ooh! It's written by a woman. I didn't know this was written by a woman. That's interesting. I have not yet read anything Japanese that has been written by women. Which I find especially interesting because Japan is so well known for its gender priority. Very, very good on the gender equality side of things, isn't it? Never, never weirdly sexualizes women. No, no, it's not, not a thing that happens there. So I think it'd be quite interesting to get a female Japanese voice. You guys know I've read a lot of Murakami, but Murakami's books, like, I like them. I think they're really good. I think they're really interesting. <laughs> so sexist. Like, they are. And the portrayals of women are... So yeah, I think a female voice would be good to add to what I have read from Japan and, like, Asia in general. Again, I know nothing, but that's why you read the books, right? You know, you want to come for an in-depth review at a book haul? Nah, I don't know what's going on, I just thought this was interesting. And also it's short, and I think that's also a good way to just get into reading anything from a new writer, or a new culture, or a new time period, is just find something short. And that is why I want to do this video of like, classics for around 100 pages, because this, these are just test tasters and testers, right? That's why I like reading those like, Penguin Great Idea books, because... <laughs> you know, microdosing literature. Why do any of you listen to me? You know, I have like two other Japanese books, I think. Okay, the other two... Oh, these are both the same by the same person. That's interesting. I bought two more Japanese books. I bought The Sound of Waves and I bought Spring So... <laughs> Spring Snow and both are by Mish... Mishima. Mishima? Mishima. Who is Mishima? Yuki Mishima was born into a samurai family and imbued with the code of complete control over mind and body and loyalty to the emperor, the same code that produced the austerity and self-sacrifice of Zen. He wrote countless stories and 33 plays, in some of which he acted. Several films have been made from his novels, including The Sound of... Oh my god. In 1970, the day he completed The Decay of the Angel, the last novel of the cycle, Mishima committed seppuku, ritual suicide, at the age of 45? What the fuck? That's in like the, in the 1970s, oh my god. What? I think this Spring Snow is his most famous book, right? I've seen it a couple of times on, not even book talk, on fucking Instagram book reels. Look, don't judge me. Right, this is Spring Snow. The first novel in the Sea of Fertili Fertility Tetrology. I'm assuming that's four books in a series. Tokyo, 
1912. The closed world of the ancient aristocracy is being breached for the first time by outsiders, rich provincial families, a new and powerful political and social elite. Kiyoki has been raised among the elegant Ayakura family, members of the reigning aristocracy, but he is not one of them. Coming of age, he is caught up in the tensions between the old and new, and confused by his feelings for the exquisite spirited Satoko. When Satoko is engaged to a royal prince, Kyoki realises with magnitude and his passion. <laughs> this is from like the 19th... 1970, no. 1968. I thought this was way older. I was assuming this was the 19th century, even though it's set in the 20th century. Well done, dumb ass. This very much is my vibe, right? The whole like, oh no, the aristocracy, you really class, blah, 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 blah. I've read so much of it from British, French, European points of view, but I think it's very interesting, you know, when you go further afield. Like, same themes, but then, you know, different setting, like, different people, and, like, people, and it's just like... <laughs> that's my, that's my, like, really intelligent, like, review of the... Yeah, man, I just love reading stuff from different places. I think it's just like, it's like, it's an adventure. Do you not want to go on an adventure? Hello, I'm filming video. Can I help you? I bought a lot of books. <laughs> no, don't send it to mummy. I'm being shamed. So, basically. No, I'm filming. Please leave. Please, please leave. leave. Please leave. Goodbye. Please leave. Bye. Yeah, filming videos has been really easy recently. It's why I've had so many. Like, it's book exploring the world, and I think I'm just consuming more Japanese stuff than I am like any other Asian country. I don't really know why that keeps happening. This, I think will be very interesting. Looking forward to that. Sounds very street. The next one is The Sound of Waves. Set in a remote fishing village in Japan, The Sound of Waves is a timeless story of first love. It tells of Shinji, a young fisherman, and Hatsu, the beautiful daughter of the wealthiest man of the village. Shinji is entranced at the sight of Hatsu in the twilight on the beach, and they fall in love when the village's gossip threatens to divide them. Shinji must risk his life to prove his worth. I think it just sounds fun. All these places that you have never been, you will never go, we can redevelop them. Okay, let's here are a couple of the modern things that I brought. Look, uh, I listen to book talk. I listen to book talks re-uploaded on two Instagram reels. So, you look, you want to talk about Zillennials? I bought Bunny by Mona Awad. Awad? Awad. I thought it sounded really good and now I've like seen other people be like, it's shit. So, I will see. If you want, I'll give you a review on this. When people try and do dark academia, when people try and write their own secret history, it's just like... I think the one that I do want to read is Babel. Or like the Tower of Babel. That actually piques my interest. And I think people have said that it's actually good. Hopefully not the same people who told me If We Were Villains was good, because that fucking book sucks, by the way. If We Were Villains sucks. That book sucks. It sucks so bad. Um, the Secret History is absolutely excellent. So let's see where this falls. Ahem. Samantha Heather Mackey is an outsider in her small, highly selective MAF program at Warren University. In fact, she is utterly repelled by the rest of her fiction writing cohort, a clique of unbearably twee rich girls who call each other bunny. But then the bunnies issue her with an invitation and Samantha finds herself inexplicably drawn to their front door. Across the threshold, and down the rabbit hole. Blending sharp satire with fairy tale horror, Bunny is a spellbinding trip of a novel from one of fiction's most original voices. I feel like I am very well situated to review this kind of stuff, especially dark academia. Like, I've also just completed my masters. I can critique on this, but like, I don't know. I can't remember at this point, I put this so long ago. I don't know why this was good. I also can't remember why people said this was bad. I can like imagine why people think this is bad. It sounds like the kind of thing that's potentially going to be quite self-indulgent. Again, these are my first impressions. This is Emma just judging the book by the cover. Potentially quite trying to be a bit more gory or gross, maybe a plot over character kind of thing. 
I mean like grossness and like stuff over plot and then you know, I feel like I can already tell what's wrong with this book. I'm very in the market obviously as we know to be pleasantly surprised but I don't have high expectations of this. I believe I will probably like trash read this in like a couple days because it sucks so we'll see. But like a couple pages I've flicked to and read I like after I bought it I kind of was reading them like uh, people do this thing where they write and they just like you understand right adding more adjectives to your writing does not make it better like this is like this like you want people understand this right just because you put in loads of magic does not make your writing better it's not elevate your style there's nothing of the fucking sort i just for god's sake some people have no idea how to write a fucking book because they've clearly never read a good book in their entire lives. Again, why read the classics? So, another book that I'm gonna got influenced, I got influenced by. This is A Certain Kind of Hunger by Chelsea Summers. I wanted the other cover. Oh my God, I wanted the other cover. I wanted the other goddamn cover. So irritating. Summers are aware. This is Food Critics, who eats her boyfriends. Sorry, a food, critic who, a food critic who eats her lovers. From her idyllic farm to table childhood to the heights of her career as a food critic, Dorothy Daniels has never been shy about indulging her exquisite tastes, even when it led to her plunging an ice pick into her lover's neck. I think this is what got me about this. That and people saying like, this is female rage. I think that's the other thing that people said about Bunny was again that this is female rage. And you know what? I will be the judge of that because I like being judgmental and I have a lot of rage. So there's that. There is something inside Dorothy that she's finally ready to confess. But beware, her story just might make you wonder how your lover would taste sauteed with shallots and mushrooms and deglazed with a little red wine. Jokes on you, I don't like mushrooms, so. Stick him in a bolognese and maybe we'll talk. A love letter to rich food and rich men and gorging on both with abandon. I feel like this will probably be better than Bunny, but in a way they will feel it they're trying to be my ear rest and relaxation. But what I do really enjoy, right, is that both are dark. These are both meant to be pretty fucking dark and I'm here for that. Okay, yes, I love the girls who are going and writing the rom-coms and who are writing the little like love stories and that kind of fiction. Like, you go write your cute little stuff, like you do you, babe. I want female rage. I want murder. I want dark. I want to punish the men who have done us wrong because they deserve it. Violently, painfully. Because I love individual men, but God, do I hate boys. And hopefully this satisfies that. And now going from like modern women doing dark shit and me supporting women's wrongs as much as I support women's rights. We go to the OGs. Finally, you would never believe it, I finally bought Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre and I finally bought Emily Bronte's Wuthering Heights. I know. I know. I've never read these and I didn't own them until two weeks ago. Look, at school, the idea of reading these was heavily imposed. The idea of like, during university, but like, you haven't read Wuthering Heights? You haven't read Jane Eyre? Like, everyone, everyone doing, like, everyone has done those. I, I did complete. That's all I wanted to do in life was read other stuff. Because I knew at some point in life I would get round to reading these. I also think that for me as a person, reading these as a teenager was never going to be it. Like, was never going to be it. I think I just needed to be more grown up, more mature, and to have moved away from the auction walls to want to go back and read about the auction walls while I'm not sat there looking at them. For those of you who don't know, I grew up in North Yorkshire, my parents just sold our childhood home there. So now all of this being in London, I feel like to let my brain roam that expanse through fiction, I think it's quite exciting. Um, I'm like, I'm looking forward to it. And I think I just need to be older. With my degree, I was shown lots of stuff I wouldn't have otherwise found, which is why I now have the mindset and confidence of just walking into, especially daunt bookshops and then being like, not sponsored by them, but like, call me and go into any part of the world and be like, ooh, ooh, ooh. So then to return to Britain, to the moors, uh, the Yorkshire moors, 
for Bronte Sisters. I'm excited. And oh my god, I need a bitch. Fuck me, do I need a bitch. These new fucking Penguin Classic covers. Does anybody else despise them? They're so awful. They're so awful. Somebody please, you, you know what I mean, right? They're fucking awful. I cannot and I refuse to buy any of those covers. They're horrible. I went out of my way to, I found these on um, a really good secondhand bookshop that I like is Abe Books. Um, again, not spawn, not affiliated, none of that stuff. I just think it's brilliant, which meant that I bought both of these secondhand environmental girly but then also i don't need to get the new fucking covers i can get the old covers and i bought these way for about three pounds each and i don't mind buying used copies because i desecrate my books anyway it's gonna look like this after i've read it for 20 minutes anyway it doesn't matter i may as well get it like for cheap gosh you start with let's start with jane Eyre. having endured humiliation and loneliness in the home of the heartless aunt reed and the harsh regime of lowood a charity boarding school the orphan jane Eyre survives her childhood unbroken in spirit and integrity when she takes up a post as a governess at thornfield hall she also finds love with her employer the dark and sardonic mr rochester but her discovery of Rochester's terrible secret forces Jane to follow her moral convictions, even if it means giving up her chance at happiness. Although many were shocked by its depiction of women's bold and passionate search for independence and love on her own terms, Jane Eyre was an immediate success when it appeared in 1847 and remains one of the most popular of all English novels. Ooh. Charlotte Bronte was born at Thornton, Yorkshire. Da -da 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 -da. So the Bronte sisters lived in Haworth in Yorkshire. Um, a small bleak town on the Yorkshire Moors. Yeah, and four sisters, Maria, Elizabeth, Emily and Anne. Didn't they have a brother as well? But yeah, I've been to, I've been to Howarth, I've been to the Bronte sisters' house. I was pretty young, I think I was maybe 13 or 14. And yeah, I've never, just never read any of their books. But obviously Jane Eyre, we all know, is a mad woman in the attic. The other one that's very famous is Emily Bronte, Wuthering Heights. Caught in a snowstorm, Lockwood and the new tenant of Thrushcross Grange on the bleak Yorkshire moors is forced to seek shelter at Wuthering Heights. When he discovers the story of the tempestuous events that took place years before, the intense passion between the foundling Heathcliff and Catherine Earnshaw, her betrayal of him, and the bitter vengeance he now wreaks on the innocent heirs of the past, Emily Bronte's novel of impossible desires, violence and transgression, is a masterpiece of intense, unsettling power. There's always that meme, did anybody see that, of like, I'm writing a book about Yorkshire Moors. I'm writing about wandering the York Moors. I'm writing my second novel. Well, mine's about rich people in big houses. Yet so's mine. Who is that creator of? I'll put her name on screen if I can find um, her handle, but that increased me, honestly. The most important question, I think, which do you guys think I should read first? because I'm going to France for a few days and I need books to read. I say that like I'm not 20 pages into a 600 page book that's non-fiction and like heavy, um, which I will get to at the end, but which you're gonna ignore that. Which fiction should I read next? I'm feeling like this is probably, I'm still young enough for this to be the one I wanna read first. A bit more like tempestuous and then this. I'll read one maybe a little bit older. But yeah, I finally have them. And fuck me, I fucking hate the new penguin um, covers. They're dreadful. Da, 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 da. Staying maybe then towards like the kind of more like gothic, and sorry, the new gothic rather. Like yeah, but more like a kind of gothic vibe. And we're gonna go Horace Walpole, The Castle of Otranto. So the reason I bought this is because we went to his house. We went to, it's called Strawberry Hill House. It's in Strawberry Hill in London, but like just next to Twickenham. It's this beautiful house. And we had a wander around, one of my friends and I did. And which it was owned by Warris, Warris, Horace Walpole. He's the youngest son of, what's his face? Walpole, who was the first Prime Minister of England. Beautiful house, if you're in London, really worth going to visit. And he wrote Castle of Otranto. He was very interested in like the Gothic and very much was part of this like neo-Gothic revival and his entire house is like built in this like kind of 
neo-gothic style and very like pastel goth but also it kind of feels like a Disney house because you know, it's a reproduction of other things and now it itself is very original but it's just it's really interesting how some really worth going and they had this for them in the gift shop so I was like you know what well in Rome the Castle of Otranto 1764 is the first supernatural English novel and one of the most influential works of gothic fiction it inaugurated a literary genre that will be forever associated with the effects that Walpole pioneered professing to be a translation of a mysterious Italian tale from the darkest middle ages the novel tells of Manfred Prince of Otranto whose fear of an ancient prophecy sets him on the course of destruction after the grotesque death of his only son Conrad on his wedding day Manfred determined to marry the bride-to-be. The virgin Isabella flees through a castle riddled with secret passages, chilling coincidences, ghostly visitations, arcane revelations, and violent combat combined in a heady mix that terrified the novel's first readers. It is in Bay of Bay's the Oxford Word Classic Editions, because these are actually fucking good. I read for the first time Mary Shelley's Frankenstein recently, and thoroughly thoroughly enjoyed it so I feel like I will also thoroughly enjoy Castle of Otranto. I've come so far round on like the gothic and the romantics and I find it really really fun now because I've read so much like 18th century enlightenment stuff and like about like you know very stoic and very rational and like reason and the pursuit of knowledge and that kind of stuff. The romantics and the gothic is just fucking silly. Like it is just it's just genuinely silly and obviously uh, embedded into that is like a very like you know interesting evaluation of contemporary culture and society and everything that's wrong with it and blah, blah, blah. but it's also just really silly when I was younger I took that very very seriously I took it really really seriously and we hate it but now I'm older I'm like Pfft. this is just dumb but my god is it fun and then yes, all the like interesting like undertones and whatever. It's very intelligent, blah blah blah. Little secret passages, spooky ghosts, spooky castle. Yes, I want to read about a spooky castle. That sounds just, just it, yes, please let me just read. I want to explore spooky things. It's just so very, it's very very fun. I will stay in the 18th century. I bought Daniel Defoe's Roxana. You may be wondering, Emma. You wrote your dissertation on that, why have you bought it? I've essentially made the executive decision that I will be buying different editions. It's really no more than that. I think this is the third or fourth copy of Roxana I have. This is like an older Oxford World Classic. The only reason is for shits and giggles. This, I love this, this makes me happy. I'm just gonna buy as many different editions as I can get my hands on. If you ever come across like an old edition online or something, send the link my way. I just think it's fun. No more reasons. Coming back then to going via Roxana, dissertation, complete degree, to comparative literature, one of the big names of comparative literature as a <laughs> genre, it's not what I meant, um, as like a field and department of studies, one of the big names is David Damrosch. I was in a bookshop, it was a Waterstones that was having to move because, I don't know, they had a sales section, so in the sales section I went perusing, and for one pound I found Around the World in 80 Books by David Damrosch. <laughs> David Damrosch is a professor of comparative literature at Harvard University and director of Harvard's Institute for World Literature. He is the author or editor of 25 books, including What is World Literature? And he has lectured in more than 50 countries around the world. What are the many worlds of world literature today? How do writers process the chaos of life into the beauty of art? How can work speak to us across space and time? These are the questions that I like to blab about on this channel. These are questions that we answer frequently. Well, attempt to answer. That's why you read lots of different things from lots of different places. It's this kind of thing, right? But the main reason that I wanted to like buy this one was first of all, knowing who David Amrish is, but this is actually just a book of literary criticism, like split up through different countries, different continents. Um, and in other words, it's a reading list. It's a reading list and essentially, I guess, a tour guide, a tour book around different literature for different places. And I think that's fun, obviously from like a Western, like a white perspective. It starts in London with Virginia Woolf, Mrs. Dalloway, Charles Dickens, Great Expectations, 
Conan Doyle, Sherlock Holmes, P.G. Woodhouse, something fresh. And then it goes into like Proust, Barnes, Dürer, Courtrails, Paris. And then we've got Krakow, Auschwitz. This, by the way, was what inspired me and reminded me to buy Prima Levi, The Periodic Table, because that's, here's a chapter on that, on Kafka. Each chapter is like Venice, Florence, Invisible Cities, which I've read. Um, oh, I've actually read all of his books, that's fun. Kaira, Istanbul, Muscat, Congo, Nigeria, Israel, Palestine. Like going through like different places, choosing maybe a few of the most important literary works for that area, and then talking through it and like, linking it all together. I think that's really fun. And this whole thing, I think maybe of like world literature, it's not about like books written to be world literature, it's more that world literature is the collection and like the understanding and viewing of things written for their specific places. So the book is written to be world literature. World literature is just your reading list, shall we say, that maybe reflects the best said cultures and said like themes and all that kind of stuff. I guess is a bastardization way of saying it. I don't know. This is just like what I feel like it is having studied Coppola and sort of the attitudes then that I've taken from doing that degree and how it influences who I am now and how I read now and like how you experience other cultures and other lives and other time periods through just reading different things from different places. Keep open minds. Open minds are good. And the most important thing is always empathy and understanding. Really, this is just more my tour guide. I don't think I will ever sit down and read as someone go. I will definitely, like, if I've read something in here, I'll give you the chapter on that. It's just literary criticism. Next up, then, let's go to... Where are we going? We're going to Poland? We are going to Poland. This is Drive Your Plough Over the Bones of the Dead by Olga Tokarczuk. Tokarczuk? Someone tell me? My brother bought her really big book for my mum for Christmas like three years ago and then my mum has read other stuff by her and she was like read this and I was like yes mummy so I bought this. I really like these editions. What are these? These are the Fitz Corraldo editions. I am a big fan of these. Um, this just... <laughs> it just gives book and nothing else. I'm sorry that's what I've been on I've been on the internet for too long. Oh yeah, she won the Nobel Prize in Literature. Minor detail. Minor, minor detail. In a remote Polish village, Janina Vizegiko, an eccentric woman in her 60s, recounts the events surrounding the disappearance of her two dogs. She is reclusive, preferring the company of animals to people. She's unconventional, believing in the stars, and she is fond of the poetry of William Blake, from whose work the title of his book is taken. When members of a local hunting club are found murdered, does Jekko become involved in the investigation? By no means a conventional crime story, this existential thriller by the Nobel Prize in Literature Laureate offers thought-provoking ideas on our perception of madness, injustice against marginalised people, animal rights, the hypocrisy of traditional religion, belief in pedestrianisation and the cause of a genuine political uproar in Poland. I don't know what this is about, but mum told me to read it and I listen to my mother when she says these sorts of things. I kind of was like, I want, it's dark now and I want to read dark things. I want to read dark things where I feel like outside it is dark and windy and probably stormy and inside I have a little candle and a fire and I sit and read warm and maybe some soup I feel like that's and then read you know you have a soup and then you read the things and the things are like spooky like spooky and then maybe bone chilling and harrowing down to your very soul um, and ghosty and spooky so really that's kind of a little bit of why I bought Jane Eyre and Wuthering Heights now as well. It was like, I want spook. I want a little bit of spook. Give me a little bit of spook. I think spook would be fun. Oh my gosh, I've got four left. I'm still not done. I'm still not bloody done. Let's go with this big boy. It's so heavy. Oh, oh it's so heavy. Why is it so big? Um, I bought Alexander Dumas, The Count of Monte Cristo. If you're thinking, that's such a boy book. That's such like a classic. I'm a boy and this is my favourite book book. You'd be correct. This is my boyfriend's favourite book, which is why I bought it. This is an act of love, okay? Because otherwise, you you know, me reading like a book that's how many pages? Over a thousand pages. I'm dyslexic. We know that this will take me five 
fucking years to read. So this is an act of love. I've had no particular inclination to pick it up on my own other than this idea that it should belong in my library and this gap in my library. Um, that's like the only real motivation I have to read it, apart from now a boy being like, that's my favourite book, you should read it, then we can talk about it together, and I'm a sucker for that. It's fine, I've bought him some of my favourite books. Like, the joy of handing this boy crime and punishment. Yes. Yes. Like, yes. That is what I want in life. I also saw this post that was like, you should read Dostoevsky when you're young and you should read Torso when you're old and wise and like that has like remained with me because that just makes sense. To anybody who's also read both, that makes sense, right? So yes, I gifted him Crime and Punishment and then I bought myself a Count of Monte Cristo. What the fuck even happens in this book? I'm assuming it's adventure. Adventure? Thriller? Give me a blurb, please. I've been told that the chapters are very short so I won't struggle too much. I was like, thanks babe. Thank you for accommodating my, my learning disability. And somehow I'm on Goodreads again. Oh, you can follow me on Goodreads. I'm Angeline. Thrown into prison for a crime he has not committed, Edmund Dante is confined to the grim fortress of If. There he learns of a great hoard of treasures hidden on the Isle of Monte Cristo, and he becomes determined not only to escape, but also to unearth the treasure, and use it to plot the destruction of the three men responsible for his incarceration. Dumas' epic tale of suffering and retribution, inspired by a real-life case of wrongful imprisonment, was a huge popular success for them when it was first serialised in the 1840s. Adventure story. Prison. Fortress. Treasure. I am sure this will be entertaining. I have no idea when I plan on reading this or if I will ever finish it, but again, this is an act of love, so at some point. Maybe. Next up, because I've got three left. I'm almost there, I promise. I got given Truman Capote in cold blood because my brother bought it and then was like I don't really want to read it, so then he gave it to me and I was like, cool. I don't know what this is about, but am I going to turn down a free book? No. Nope. Dick became convinced that Perry was that rarity. A natural killer, absolutely sane, but conscienceless, and capable of dealing with, or without motive, the coldest blooded death blows. On the 15th of November 1959, in a small town of Holcomb, Kansas, a wealthy farmer, his wife, and their two young children were found brutally murdered. Blood all over the walls, the telephone lines were cut, and only a few dollars stolen. Heading up the investigation is Agent Al Dewey, but all he has are two footprints, four bodies, and a whole lot of questions. Truman Capote's detailed reconstruction of the event and consequences of that fateful night in cold blood is a chilling, gripping mix of journalistic skill and imaginative power. Oh, is this not... Fiction. I thought this was fiction. Is this fiction? I feel like maybe that's what's confused my brother as well, but we couldn't, didn't really understand if it was fiction or not. My brother is a true crime girly. I am not. So, I will... I feel like I'll... Yeah, I don't, I don't know when I'll read this. This feels like a read on summer holiday in the sun kind of thing. Because I get spooked by this kind of stuff, so... Almost there. Second to last book, I bought Jerusalem, the biography by Simon Seabag Montefiore. Which is just... Can we just discuss how good a last name Montefiore is? Because... God damn, that's a good last name. So with all of the current Israeli-Palestinian conflict that's going on, it kind of again occurred to me how much I don't know. So I thought that Jerusalem was probably a very good place to start because this is a very big history of a very specific city, which then in turn tells the rest of the story of the area. And it has maps in the back, which help, even if you will dispute them, but yeah. What is this? It's like 600 pages. It's 700 pages. I am reading it at the moment. I've read, you know what, to be fair, I've read about 40 pages. I am enjoying it at the moment. I think it's a very clear book and also trying to write. Can you imagine trying to write this and like walking this like basically impossible tightrope of religion and politics and I, yeah, I can't imagine trying to write this book. This book is from about 10 years ago, is it? This is from 2011. My brothers read it and said it was very good, but yeah, it's just trying to do 3,000 years of a city's history that is so important to three faiths, really more than three faiths, so many people's, like, 
this is a massive undertaking. And so far he's telling it in a very consumable way. Um, I'm still in the bit where it's talking about like the like early kings of Jerusalem and like David and like the Israelites and stuff. So I've not read much of it, but the way it's being told is great because I if it's if history books if I read nonfiction and history books and it's too dry, I can absorb nothing. I absorb nothing, my brain comes like a sieve. I read the whole book and I recall absolutely nothing. And it's happened multiple times and it's really annoying to read a history book. And people ask us about it and they're like, didn't you read on that? I'm like, yeah, I did, but I can't remember anything. So this is told in a much more engaging way. And I appreciate that because otherwise I won't remember anything. And this is definitely considering like the modern conflict, an important history to know and understand. So yeah. I it's pretty good so far and the very final thing in this massive book haul because oh my god what is wrong with me um, i bought this ages and ages and ages ago this is Stendhal love as you may know i am a big fan of Stendhal i have been for well, while well, Stendhal is a love hate thing right i hated the red and the black i hated it so much but the child house of palmer is one of my favorite books so i saw this second hand for like three pounds and I was like don't mind if I do. In 1880 when he was in his mid-thirties Stendhal met and fell passionately in love with the beautiful Mathilde Dembarski. She however was quick to make it clear that she did not return his affections and his despair turned to a written word to exercise exercise and exorcism <laughs> his love and explain his feelings. The result was an intensely personal dissection of the process of falling and being in love, a unique blend of poetry, anecdote, philosophy, psychology, and social observation, bringing together conflicting sides of his nature, but deeply emotional and cruelly analytical. Stendhal created a work that is both acutely personal and universally applicable. Urgh. Not a novel, more of amusing, a diary, thoughts. Vibes. I need to stop saying vibes in every single video. Okay, we've done 17 books. Yeah, I just bought that because I could, frankly. I love buying secondhand books. It makes it so much easier to buy, so I'm just like, yep, mine now. But yes, there we go. That is a massive pile of books. And you know what's worse? There's still a huge pile of books here. It's, but that's more like themed, so hopefully I'll film that fairly soon. But yes. That is all of the books I've bought over the last few months. I knew that I had to just make this video, get it off my desk, get it off my chest. Let me know if you have read any of these. Let me know what you think needs to go straight to the top of my TBR, what you think needs to go in the bin. I'm always all ears and your comments do nothing but give me constant levels of joy. So please, right away, I read everything. I see everything, but that is like, you know, arguably and always the biggest perk of doing this. There we have it. I now need to find space for these fucking books in my bookshelves and look, I moved rooms, got way more shelves and I still don't have any space. So, <sighs> such is the plight of the <laughs> book reader. It's really hard to like read lots of books because there's no space for them anywhere. Thank you very, very much for watching. Have a very merry Christmas or whatever holiday you celebrate this season. Like, subscribe, and all that jazz, and I will see you guys hopefully very, very soon. Goodbye. <laughs>